Hi, everyone. It's Dr. Tofi. Uh, we are going to do this as a Facebook Live on my Beverly Hills Hernia Center webpage. So for any of you that are also logging in from that aspect, please, please um, try to go on my Facebook page, uh, the Beverly Hills Hernia Center Facebook page. For some reason, the regular Dr. Tofi Facebook page is not linking in. But for those of you that have joined me, welcome. Uh, today's a Tuesday, Hernia Talk Live Tuesday. Thanks for joining me. My name is Dr. Sharin Tofai. I am at the Beverly Hills Hernia Center. I am your hernia and laparoscopic surgery specialist. As you know, I am on Facebook at Dr. Tofai, but I also have another Facebook page called uh, at Beverly Hills Hernia Center. So please try and go there if you want to uh, join me live via Facebook. And then, um, as with all prior episodes, are they're going to be on my YouTube channel. So go to and subscribe to youtube.com slash at hernia doc. So hernia doc is also my moniker on YouTube, Instagram, X, and I'd love to see you all there. So I kind of was deciding what to do for today's uh, episode. And it, it turns out it's a perfect episode for today. So we're going to talk about choosing the different surgical techniques for your hernia, whether it's open, laparoscopic, or robotic. Those are the three options that you have as a patient. And you may have been approached, you may have been told, oh, you have to get this done open, or you have to get this done laparoscopic. Robotics, the only way to do it, et cetera. That may or may not be true. And so how do you know which technique to choose? And that's what we'll discuss today. And we have a lot of questions that was submitted and there's already one question that's live here. So um, we will talk about open laparoscopic and robotic surgery today. We will talk about mesh and non-mesh repairs. We will talk about all types of abdominal hernias, whether it's abdominal, ventral, incisional, flank, perineal, pelvic, inguinal, all of those will be addressed. And I'll kind of give you my bent. Uh, doesn't mean it's the most correct bent. It's kind of the way that I approach things, but I'm going to share with you some different patient case scenarios. Some of them were done, were patients I saw, you know, already this week. And uh, hopefully they'll give you a little bit of insight. So prior to any minimally invasive surgery technology, which was first brought around in the 19th, I want to say 80s, Prior to that, every surgery was done open, which means there's a scar, you make an incision and you go in there and do the surgery. So when we say open surgery, that's what we mean. Then we, the gynecologist initiated what's called laparoscopic surgery in the United Kingdom, they call it keyhole surgery. And that involves not a big incision, but smaller incisions, usually ranging between five and 12 millimeters. And those incisions would take the place of the open surgery incision, but effectively the similar operation is done on the inside, usually inside the abdomen. And that's what a lot of general surgeons do is either open or laparoscopic surgery. And that could be for gallbladder, appendix, stomach surgery, colon surgery, et cetera. Somewhere around the early 2000s, the robotic surgery technology or late 1990s, the robotic surgery technique started usually mostly with the urologist. They couldn't really get it with the, with the, the general surgeons, but now a lot of general surgeons also offer robotic surgery. Conceptually, it's the same exact operation as open or laparoscopic surgery, except, um, and it's very similar to laparoscopic surgery from the outside, because you have multiple scars. From the inside, it should be very similar to open surgery. However, the um, technology is different. So with laparoscopic surgery, we call them like chopsticks. So the surgeon is, is doing the operation. They're holding instruments like chopsticks and those instruments are being manipulated with my own hands and I'm touching tissue inside the abdomen. Whereas with robotic surgery, I am I have a robotic approach to it. So I am not physically touching the instruments that go into your body. That Those instruments are attached to a robotic machine. And then kind of like you would with the RC car or any type of radio control, 
you know, car or a video game, I have a separate console or machine that I sit behind and I manipulate those robotic arms. So the robot's not doing the surgery, I'm fully in control of the surgery, but the technology is different. Theoretically, all the operations give you the same type of surgery, right? So hernia surgery, we fix a hernia. You can do that open laparoscopic or robotic. However, because of the different approaches, you can have different risks, different benefits, different recoveries, different complication rates, and not everyone is a good candidate for those different options. And I'll give an example. For the groin, there's open laparoscopic and robotic surgery. The open surgery, you can do it without general anesthesia. The laparoscopic and robotic surgery, you typically cannot do it without general anesthesia. So if you're perfectly healthy and you can undergo general anesthesia, it really doesn't make that much more of a difference anesthesia-wise which one you choose. But if you're 90 years old or, or need a heart transplant, then you should err on doing the operation with the least amount of anesthesia for the patient, which is almost always open surgery. So that's kind of where we are. The same is true of the abdominal wall, like small, you know, you can do a small little belly button hernia through open surgery. You don't need multiple incisions to do that. Um, but for a big abdominal wall reconstruction, you may choose to do it robotically because there's less risk of mesh infection and complications. So we're gonna go through that piecemeal. Um, and then as you send me the questions, I'll answer your questions as well. We already have a great question, which says for bilateral hernia repairs, either inguinal or femoral, number one is laparoscopic extraperitoneal mesh repair, a standard repair. And number two, what are the dangers of this repair? So um, there is no standard hernia repair. There are excellent hernia repairs that are either open, laparoscopic, or robotic. And there is no gold standard for ingual hernia. There are preferred operations. So if you have, let's say, bilateral hernia repairs, hernias that need to be repaired in the groin, it's recommended that a laparoscopic repair is superior to an open repair because with the same incision, you can do both hernias at the same time without changing the patient's recovery. Whereas if you did the same thing for an open repair, doing two open surgeries left and right at the same time would involve a lot of scarring, a lot of incision to heal, longer recovery and higher recurrence rate. So we have good evidence to support for bilateral hernia, uh, hernias in the groin, ingual and or femoral laparoscopic repair should be the best choice. Is it the best choice for everyone? No, I'll give you an example. If you are a 90 year old male with congestive heart failure and you have really painful hernias that keep getting stuck on both sides, I would not offer you robotic or laparoscopic surgery. Why? Because I need to put you under general anesthesia to do that. And that may be too detrimental to your heart and brain. We talked about, you know, uh, general anesthesia and, and brain stuff um, with our pain management doctors yes, uh, last week. So in that situation, I would do open surgery. Let's say another patient that I had recently, he has something called mastocytosis. So mastocytosis is kind of a ov overly active um, situation of your mast cells. People who have allergies know what mast cells are. Mast cells, M-A-S-T. Mast cells are part of the um, allergic reaction that you get to grass and pollen and, and so on. So if you're overly um, in that stage where your allergies are overly reactive, then you can have more allergies and more reactions to what normal people would otherwise not have. So this patient, because of his mastocytosis, for example, is on a very restricted diet. If you, he eats a diet 
that is gluten-free, very low in inflammatory, call it an anti-inflammatory diet, he does great. If you eat, let's say, hot dogs and um, beef jerky, uh, highly processed foods, say chips, then he's going to break out into a full body rash. He's going to feel ill. His joints may start hurting, etc. That is the life of someone with mastocytosis. Now, let's say that patient has bilateral, so left and right ingle hernias. In a normal situation, I would say, oh, you look like a healthy patient, male, hernias on both sides. You're uh, healthy. You want to be active. Yeah, absolutely. Laparoscopic repair of both sides. That would be my recommendation for the typical patient. It involves mesh, though. It involves mesh. So this specific patient that has mastocytosis, as an example, I would not put mesh in. Why? Because that is an inflammatory implant that I would not recommend being placed in a patient with a known inflammatory disorder because they will, they will be at risk of reacting to that mesh. And by reaction, I mean they may get into full body rash, their mastocytosis may be poorly uh, able to be controlled. They may have body aches and pains and joint pains and swelling and so on. Kind of like that mesh implant illness situation that we've talked about before. So I will I would not knowingly want to induce that or risk inducing that. We don't know exactly how much that's going to bother them, but that's kind of the situation. So that's a situation where, yes, it is true. The community standard, um, actually, I can't even say that. The the best practices for the typical lapis for the typical bilateral ingle hernia to be repaired would be a laparoscopic with mesh. What if you're in a country with poor resources? Perfectly okay to do open surgery with them. Perfectly okay not even to use mesh in those patients. It's not considered below standard to do that. So the question here is, is it uh, a laparoscopic extra perineal mesh, a standard repair? It is considered standard. Um, what are the dangers of this type of repair? So number one, you're using general anesthesia. So you got to make sure the patient's healthy for general anesthesia. Number two, at least in my practice, I always put a urinary catheter in patients. In doing so, that it may induce potentially uh, inflammation of the prostate or uh, urinary retention after surgery, possibly, but not necessarily. Number three, there are not that many nerves that can be injured. There are two specific nerves, the general femoral nerve and the lateral femoral cutaneous nerve. Both of them are at risk of injury, very low risk. Your surgeon pretty much not, needs to not know what they're doing um, to, uh, to risk those nerves because they're very hard to injure. They are typically deep to a fascia and um, most people who do laparoscopic surgery that do it for a living understand where those nerves are and do their best not to injure it. Number four, if you have a lot of fat in your hernia and you try and reduce that fat laparoscopically, there is a chance, small chance, but there is a chance you may not be able to reduce all that fat. And so if the dominant hernia is cord lipoma or a lot of fat in the space, then with a laparoscopic repair, one of the risks compared to an open repair would be to miss being able to reduce all of, all of that fat. It happens, it is a risk. Um, number five, there are major vessels in the area that you can injure. Uh, again, uh, it's a risk, but it's a like fraction of a fraction of a fraction of a percent. If you're, if you pick a surgeon who's good at what they're doing, that should never happen. Um, there's different approaches to getting to that extra peritoneal space and older studies using non-specialists they found either vascular injury, which means those major vessels that I talked about could be injured, and they had patients that had their intestines injured. I shared a story several, maybe several months ago, where um, colon, the, the large intestine was injured as part of an extra peritoneal repair in a patient that I think he had some type of 
prior severe diverticulitis with perforation that caused the colon to get stuck where the hernia was. And so that area was dissected for the hernia and in doing so they injured the colon. Um, so, you know, complications occur with every surgery, but these are the main complications that we talk about. Uh, also, lastly, laparoscopic surgery has a higher risk of blood clots than um, open surgery just because of the, the gas that we have to insufflate into the abdomen. Again, this is a lot of complications that we can review with the patient. Most of them are not relevant. They're a fraction of a fraction of a fraction of a percent. Um, infection, for example, very, very low risk. Mesh infection, I've had it in one patient. So it happens, but it's really, 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 I like there are some serious um, epidemiology you have to look into if a patient gets a mesh infection, like was the mesh itself already like not sterile and things like that, because it's very, very low risk to get a mesh infection from a laparoscopic surgery. Not that it hasn't happened, but uh, it's it's not something that we typically talk about. So those are the, quote, risks of the procedure with a laparoscopic repair. And you have to see, like, how much of a risk is there? So, for example, uh, oh, lastly, there, the fact that you, you have to have mesh in you. So the mesh-based laparoscopic repair, which is considered the standard type of laparoscopic repair, does involve mesh. So is a patient at risk of having their mesh folded? Um, or are they going to feel the mesh? Will the mesh erode into any nearby structures? Will it impinge on the spermatic cord and cause testicular pain? Could it fold and touch the bladder and cause urinary uh, frequency? Is it placed too low and it can cause bending, pain with bending at the hip, going upstairs uh, and sitting? So these are all risks of the surgery, not intrinsic to the surgery, more surgical technique complications. Um, if you use some type of, what do you call it, um, tax, for example, uh, or fixation, you have a higher risk of fixation related uh, injuries to the nerves and, and chronic pain and tearing of the muscles. And I had one patient that bled from the, the, the tack going like dislodging and hitting a vessel. So Again, um, these are all low risk probabilities, but you know it, it is what it, it can happen. So that's the risk of a laparoscopic approach for ingual hernias. Um, so why would someone? You may be like, "Wow, that's <laughs> that's a lot of complications." Well, surgery has a lot of complications. Um, those of us that do surgery, and the more senior we get, the more complications we know about and are aware of. So when we go in to do an operate, actually let's back out, back out. out. Um, when we recommend a surgery for a patient, we usually do it understanding that all these risks. So if we have like a wider view of what we're offering. And so when I tell a patient, I recommend laparoscopic surgery, it's understanding that I know the whole cadre of uh, complications this patient may be at risk for compared to all the other techniques and the complications they may be at risk of, um, let's say for open surgery. So that's kind of uh, where it is. Let's see, um, we have another question. What symptoms would you expect if general femoral nerve is injured? So the general femoral nerve may be injured during a laparoscopic repair and the, or, or an open repair or a robotic repair. So that area is exposed and it's, a, it's near the hernia often. So it is at risk. People that have genital branch of the genital femoral nerve. So the genital femoral nerve branches out. There's two branches, as the name implies, the genital branch and the femoral branch of the genital femoral nerve. The genital branch causes symptoms sorry, causes sensation to the scrotal skin on that side in men and to the mons skin for women, okay? So if you have that nerve injured, you will either be numb or you'll have burning sensation over your scrotal and hypersensitivity over your scrotal skin in males, over the mons uh, in female females. 
Now, the femoral branch is less likely to be injured, but if it is injured, you would get numbness or painful numbness or um, burning and hypersensitivity in a small area in the upper thigh just below the growing crease. That's where the femoral branch of the general femoral nerve is. Sometimes some people may have inner thigh symptoms from general femoral. It's not as common, but there is some inner thigh uh, sensation from the general femoral nerve. So that's the answer for that. So you may say, okay, well, why would you choose an open or a laparoscopic repair over an open repair? And again, let's focus on inguinal and we'll move on to the abdominal surgeries. Um, well, uh, I'll, I'll explain to you my, my thought about it because I do offer open laparoscopic and robotic. So I, when I talk to a patient, I'm able to kind of offer them all op opportunities and then figure out which one's best for them. So I think the patient is best served. Okay. Um, <laughs> let's go back again. However, there are some surgeons that do not offer laparoscopic surgery at all, mostly because the laparoscopic inguinal hernia repair is considered a complex operation that not all people are really good at. So, and most surgeons in the United States do not offer laparoscopic surgery. That said, uh, your surgeon may say, oh, you should get open surgery. The question is, do you offer laparoscopic surgery, doctor surgeon, and is that, and are you offering me open surgery knowing you can also perform laparoscopic surgery, but you're choosing the open surgery as the preferred operation for me? Or are you offering me open surgery because that's the only technique you know how to do? That's a very important distinction. I'll give you an example. I had a patient recently who um, is married to a doctor. So, he has uh, bilateral ingle hernias and they talked to all their doctor friends. And one doctor friend said, oh, you must have it done open. Another one said, oh, you must have it done laparoscopically. Oh, you must have mesh. Said, you don't, you shouldn't ha never have mesh. As you know, I do not like the must have and should never. And those are very absolute terms because every patient's a little bit different. So, um, when would I choose an, or recommend an open surgery? Well, for sure, if the patient wants a non-mesh repair or is a candidate for a non-mesh repair or, or should get a non-mesh repair, then the open repair would be the first choice. There is a robotic non-mesh repair that I do offer for the groin. It's only for really small occult hernias that are symptomatic and not for any femoral hernias. So, it's a limited number of patients that are eligible for that. So let's say you're not in that category and you know you have a bulging hernia. So an open repair would be best for, number one, people that are not good candidates for general anesthesia. Number two, if you want to choose a, a non-mesh repair. And number three, if they sh cannot have a, a, a mesh like the patient I just mentioned with mastocytosis. So typically an open mesh repair um, it's called a Liechtenstein repair. It's considered gold standard by many people. I don't like that term because a laparoscopic repair is not any less gold standard. But if you look at the world and the type of repairs done in the world, they're almost always done open. Laparoscopic really hasn't penetrated the, the world, mostly because it's expensive and it involves a lot of technology. So you can do an open ingle hernia repair in most countries and um, where mesh is available. Um, and prior to mesh, we were doing open tissue repairs. So the open repair has a longer recovery and a higher risk of chronic pain, if, especially if it's not done by a specialist. Um, but again, you can be a really amazing open surgery surgeon that never does any laparoscopic surgery and have excellent outcomes. Or you can be a horrible open surgery um, surgeon that let's say mostly 
due to um, mostly because you do laparoscopic surgery, you're not really good at open surgery, it's possible, or you're uncomfortable and you can do great laparoscopic surgery and a horrible open surgery. So every surgeon is different in their skill set and what they offer. And so when you do go for a consultation, um, if they offer you a certain operation, you may want to ask why they're offering that. Is it because they offer all operations like I do? And based on their knowledge of all the risks with all the three different choices, that's the one they recommend for you? Or is it because that's the only operation they do or it's the best operation they do? Let's say they dabble in laparoscopic surgery, but they've been doing open surgery for 30 years. In that, in that population, don't force your surgeon to do a laparoscopic repair when the, the best outcome in their hands would be if they did open surgery. Does that make sense? I hope that makes sense. <laughs> Raise your hand if that makes sense, because I feel like um, I need to make sure that, that we're kind of understanding uh, this. Thank you, raising your hand. All right, great, appreciate it. <laughs> um, okay, so going back, so we did inguinal. Now let's go to the ventral hernia repairs. So ventral hernia repairs or abdominal wall hernia repairs include uh, belly button, um, above the belly button, kind of ventral means the front of the belly. Uh, it can be the flanks, kind of the side of the belly, the back or some rare, rare hernias you can get in the pelvis. So hernias that occur outside of the groin, we usually call abdominal wall hernias. Sometimes they are, you're born with it or you develop it. Sometimes you get it after a surgery. So let's say you had a trauma and then they have to cut your belly open to save your life. You have a high risk of getting an incisional hernia from that. I think it's the 20 to 25% risk for traumas. Let's say you had colon cancer and they did open surgery for your colon cancer. That's about 11% risk of having incisional hernia from that. So depending on the type of surgery you have, you may be at higher risk for um, I mean, yes, the smaller the, the smaller the incision, the lower the risk of your incision having a hernia. The further out from the midline, um, well, let me let me rephrase this. The midline and the very far right, uh, far left, uh, hernias are, incisions are at higher risk for having a hernia. So based on that, the question is, should you have your hernia done open or laparoscopic? And before I move on, looks like there's a question. How do you, how do you decide in an inguinal hernia tap repair whether to fix it or not? And can you get pain from either suturing or tacking Cooper's ligament? So um, no, there's no pain or, from tacking or suturing into Cooper's ligament. The pain that we see from fixation is when it's fixated to the abdominal wall to the muscle because they can go in too deep and penetrate the abdominal wall and get the nerve on the other side. They can go too deep and make it too tight. So the tightness of the fixation um, can be a problem, but fixating to Cooper's ligament has never been shown to ha have actual pain. You can use too many fixation devices. Um, I just have a recent patient with 11 tacks on just one side. Um, it's not my record. I think 19 on one side was the record or was it 30? 30 was the abdominal wall. So 19 in the groin. Um, so too many tacks can cause muscle spasm and, and chronic pain. Um, and in general, suturing tends to cause less pain than tacks because it's a little bit more controlled. However, um, you can choose not to fixate. So for the typical ingual hernia, uh, you can do laparoscopic hernia repair and do no um, fixation. However, if you have an extremely large hole in your indirect space, any non-small direct hernia or any recurrent hernia, I recommend using fixation because, oh, sorry, and any femoral hernia, I I recommend using fixation, understanding that most of those hernias are indirect angle hernias and do not need fixation. Um, so, and then the lighter the mesh, the more likely you'll need fixation. So if you, the heavier weight mesh you use, the less, the less fixation you need. 
Here's another question. What type of repair do you recommend for someone that has a mesh reaction and has a growing hernia, growing hernia in her pubic area after a mesh removal surgery? Current surgeon recommends tissue repair, shoulder dye specifically, which he doesn't offer. He re recommends shoulder dye surgeon in Stony Brook, New York, Dr. Samir Spy, which is, uh, yeah, he was a, pr a previous guest on Hernia Talk Live. So in people that have known mesh reaction or mesh implant illness, a non-mesh repair is indicated. And then the question is what suture to use because you can make maybe also react to the suture. However, if you have a known collagen disorder such as Ehlers-Danlos syndrome, a tissue repair is not adequate. Um, that's where the problem is in, in some patients is they really do need a, a mesh repair. Now, can you do a tissue repair and then hope for the best? You can. Is it going to recur? Not 100%. And I don't know what the number would be because most people with Ehlers-Danlos do not get tissue repairs. Um, the typical shoulder dice technique should be about 2% um, to 7% recurrence rate, depending on the surgeon, uh, assuming surgeons that do a lot of it. But the understand that tissue repair involves disrupting the tissue before you sew it. So you're actually cutting open and then re-sewing it. So in a typical hernia, that tissue is not open. You have to physically cause a hernia to then sew it. So in someone with Ehlers-Danlos syndrome, you don't want to do a typical shoulder ice repair because if it falls apart, which is very likely, you now have a wide open hole that you didn't have before surgery. So if you have Ehlers-Danlos and someone is offering you a tissue repair, they cannot do the traditional shoulder dice repair, for example, because or any traditional tissue repair. You have to do a modified repair because you just want to tighten the area. You don't want to um, cut the area to then tighten it because that would fall apart. And when it falls apart, now you have a big gaping hole that you did not have before surgery. So that's my only... Um, a recommendation for the for that that part okay going back to laparoscopic versus ro open versus robotic abdominal wall hernia so my specific bent is if you have a really small hernia so one centimeter um you should just get that fixed open and you can hide your scar so it looks scarless and most umbilical epigastric hernias are in that range so Good to do. Any hernia over two centimeters requires mesh and any hernia between one and two centimeters is controversial. What is the best repair? Depends on the patient and their lifestyle. So um, a lot of people do laparoscopic or robotic surgery for the abdominal wall ventral hernia repair. Why? Number one, those tend to have more pain, more risk of um, mesh infection and or surgical site infection when done open. So we've moved away from doing too much open surgery, if possible. And so that's where laparoscopic and robotic surgery has made the biggest impact for abdominal wall hernias. So umbilical, epigastric, typical incisional hernias. That said, you need at least three, sometimes four incisions for laparoscopic or robotic incision surgery. And... If you have a little one centimeter belly button hernia or 1.5 centimeter belly button, hernia, you need about a one to two centimeter um, incision to do that. It doesn't make sense to make four separate incisions when you can get the job done in, in one, one incision. So that's my take on it. However, definitely when thinking of abdominal wall, you should consider the risks and benefits of open versus the minimum invasive laparoscopic robotic. I would say follow your surgeon's lead. So some surgeons are really good with open surgery, have them do it open. Some surgeons are really gifted with robotic or laparoscopic surgery, have them do that. If they're kind of wishy-washy about it, 
get a second opinion. If they say there's no other way to do it, get a second opinion. That's kind of my take on it. Now, what do I recommend with regard to um, which one's best? I'm very conscious of the cosmetic outcome for people. And I also want to give the best surgery. So morbidly obese patient, don't do it open. Either do it laparoscopic or robotic surgery because the risk of wound infection and mesh infection is not worth any cosmetic benefit. If you have a nice, if you have an ugly scar from your trauma surgery or an infected wound, I do those open because I like to give you a nicer scar and then maybe a little tummy tuck as part of it. So I like to do those, to do those open. If it's complicated or not um, less than four centimeter hernia, I like to do those laparoscopic or robotic. If they're super complicated in like the nine to 10 centimeter range, I like to do those robotically. If they're complete loss of domain and they've had so many surgeries, it's kind of too dangerous to do it any other way but open. So it that kind of depends on the patient. Now, here's another question about Ehlers-Danlos. Is there an Ehlers-Danlos-like phenotype with poor collagen fascia quality without full blue, blown Ehlers-Danlos and how can you recognize and manage it? So we've talked about Ehlers-Danlos syndrome before. Ehlers-Danlos syndrome or EDS uh, is a collagen disorder. So if you watch Cirque du Soleil, actually I just recently posted a patient, I recently posted a, a dancer on my Instagram who I'm willing to bet has Ehlers-Danlos syndrome. These are people where their joints can come out of their sockets and they're hyperextensible, their skin is hyper, or, or they're hypermobile. They typically have joint um, dislocations of their knee or shoulder. They can pull their scapula in and out. Um, their th some tests are their thumb can go all the way down and hit their um, hit their uh, their forearm. Uh, if you check their elbows, they hyperextended the elbows uh, and so on. Or they can sit in these kind of ways where their legs can go around their heads and so on. So Cirque du Soleil is like the classic situation. A lot of those dancers have some type of hyperflexibility or hypermobility, which is an Ehlers-Danlos syndrome type. Now, can you have hypermobility or hyperflexibility syndrome without Ehlers-Danlos? Yes. That's what it's called. It's called hyperflexibility or hypermobility syndrome because Ehlers-Danlos is a specific genetic disease. Um, does it matter which one you are? No, because you are prone to hernias. You may have direct angle hernias, chronic pelvic pain, pelvic floor disorder, umbilical hernias, acid reflux due to hiatal hernias. You may also have other problems like visual, like the muscles in your eye are um, weak and all that. Um, how do you recognize it? There are multiple tests. So uh, one is the test of, of uh, how flexible your joints are. Um, other is to kind of look at the, see the angle, if you can bring your angle of your thumb to be more 90 degrees. Uh, some people, when they open their hands up, they can, are hyper extensible at the, at the joints of their fingers. If they're standing and, and their um, knees kind of pull back further uh, than a typical standing person, that's a hyper uh, flexibility. If their scapula can be pushed in and out, if they have um, some people, they can, they can uh, uh, bend down and put put their hands on the floor completely, and others can even put their uh, almost their elbows down on the floor, uh, bending down with keeping their legs straight. So these are all like like different tests. Some people actually have very hypermobile skin. So if you, you they pinch their skin, you can really pull it up. The highly elastic skin. These are all collagen disorders. The skin has a lot of collagen and your joints have a lot of collagen. So if you are lacking adequate mature collagen in those situations, then you may have a hyperflexibility or hypermobility disorder. A genetic consult may be helpful. A rheumatology consult um, may be helpful. 
there are other implications besides the orthopedic implications with this. So why is that important? Because the type of surgery that you get, um, the outcome will be affected by it if you're not being told, if you're not aware, if the surgeon's not aware. So let's say you have colon cancer and you need colon surgery. Well, the incision that through which they're going to remove your colon needs to be made a certain amount. You will 100% get an incisional hernia if you're tr if you do have this hypermobility problem or Ehlers Danlos syndrome, and your surgeon is unaware of it, and they close your your hernia like a normal person would, uh, doesn't work. So those are like little things to think about uh, if you're hyperflexible or hypermobile. Um, and then you can get genetic testing to see if you actually have Ehlers Danlos syndrome. The reason why the naming of the genetic of the genetic disorder is important is because Ehlers Danlos syndrome is also associated with other diseases like POTS, like SIBO, SIBO, like endometriosis, um, and maybe a reason for your acid reflux and so on. So um it's from a health standpoint, it's good to know all those. Also, it's it's genetic, so it can be passed on to your children, or you may have gotten it from your parents, and uh, of course that's important. With regard to open versus laparoscopic versus robotic, unlike inguinal hernias, all of those operations can be done with or without mesh. Um, now, it's not considered standard to do a laparoscopic or robotic surgery without mesh, but it's definitely doable, whereas it's not that doable for an inguinal hernia. Here's another question. Does the balloon used to dissect the retrorectus space during TEP cause widening of the diastasis recti and how can it not? It does not because it does not, um, the balloon dissects behind the rectus muscle, not in the midline. So um, it does not cause widening of the diastasis recti. So for example, the balloon that I use is not the, it's, it's I use it only on one side and then the rest I do manually. So the midline never gets dissected out. But let's say you do have the commercially used balloon where it dissects both sides at the same time or it can, then, it, but it's introduced on the left side or the right side. Um, so no, it uh, it doesn't cause any widening of the diastasis. Um, okay, let's see. What were we talking about? Here's another question. Uh, okay, multiple questions. Uh, this hernia recurred way sooner after mesh removal than we were hoping. I've never been diagnosed with full-blown Ehlers-Danlos and don't have any of the extreme symptoms. So maybe shoulder dice could be an option. Also, can stainless steel sutures cause inflammatory reactions like mesh? Okay, good question. So number one, uh, yes, shoulder dice can be an option. Um, but, but if you've already failed prior tissue repairs, you may fail it again. Shoulder dice... Uh, being another tissue repair. Again, if you do have Ehlers Danlos or some type of collagen disorder or um, hyperflexibility or hypermobility, and you undergo tissue repair, the key is not to treat you like the typical patient where you cut open the entire inguinal floor to then resuture it. That is all tissue repairs do that. Bassini, McVay, shoulder dice. Your surgeon should revise the technique and maybe do a bassini repair so that your tissue repair is not opened, does not result, you are not damaging tissue in order to repair the repair because damaging tissue in someone with a known collagen disorder is going to potentially cause your hernia recurrence to be even larger and more difficult to handle. Also, can stainless steel sutures cause inflammatory reactions like mesh? No. Stainless steel sutures in general are not as likely to cause <clears throat> to cause an inflammatory reaction. So that's a positive thing. Um, that said, there are people that have reactions to tax and clips, I, which are titanium-based, and some of them have nickel in it. So you have to make sure that the stainless steel suture they're using is pure stainless steel and does not include 
um, any uh, nickel uh, within it. But it is a good option. The other option would be a use of nylon suture, which is the least inflammatory of all the sutures that are permitted. Could extraperitoneal mesh affect the iliofemoral arterial velocities or would femoral canal hernia repairs most likely affect blood flow? In the sitting position, my common femoral artery velocities increase and the left external iliac artery. Okay. Doppler waveform supine are normal and biphasic throughout and the velocities were not elevated. Should this abnormality be rectified? Okay. So femoral hernias are best repaired. Okay, let's go back. Femoral hernias are best repaired laparoscopically. That said, whether it's inguinal or femoral hernia, the mesh that's placed will be having mesh on top of the external iliac artery and vein. Does that cause obstruction of blood flow? It should not because it doesn't, it, it lays on it like a blanket would. It doesn't lay on it like a guillotine would. So it should not. However, it's possible that the waveform from the mesh is affected because the mesh that's currently there can be impinging on the can be impinging on the the vessels uncommon and really uncommon for the artery to be affected the vein can be now if you already have an arterial blood flow issue i assume you're going to be worked up for like a blood clot or something but if your arterial if your artery has a higher velocity, that means it's somehow kinked or blood flow to it is compromised when you're sitting, then if it's from the surgery, then you have to see if your mesh is kinked or there's a meshoma that's pushing on the vessel. If you're if you've not had mesh, because I'm I'm not clear if this patient has had mesh before or not. If you've not had mesh and you have a difference on one side versus the other of arterial velocity, then that's a vascular issue that needs to be addressed to see why you have an obstructive problem when you're sitting on one side and not the other. Do you have, let's say, pelvic congestion syndrome? Um, although most of those issues are venous and you're talking about arterial. So I hope that clears it up. Um, let's see, what other questions can we talk about? Open versus lab versus robotic. Okay, the one thing I would say is, though I'm a big fan of laparoscopic surgery and, and my training was in laparoscopic surgery, um, the current wave in the United States, at least, not in most of the other countries, is to start using robotic surgery. So I also do robotic surgery. There are some people that were never comfortable with the laparoscopic approach because it's very complicated and difficult to do. And those people are now really enjoying robotic surgery because they're able to provide a highly, um, uh, a very good quality operation with minimally invasive technique using the robotic technology that they couldn't offer to patients before. So I think that's a good thing, right? It's always better to, um, at least offer some type of minimally invasive operation if you can. Do I think the robotic platform should be used for everything? No, there are some people that do. I'm not one of those. I like to tailor to the needs of the patient. Are there certain operations that are better done robotically than laparoscopically open? Absolutely. For example, mesh removals from, from prior laparoscopic mesh, I prefer to do robotically, but can it be done with open or laparoscopic? Yes, it probably should never be done open unless in certain circumstances, but definitely can be um, can be performed uh, laparoscopically, which is what we did before the robotic technology. Um, 
some people believe that the robotic repair is superior in many ways. Now, one of the better reasons for robotic um, surgery technology is it kind of mimics the open surgical technique more than, than the laparoscopic, um, similar to how eating with a knife and fork mimics eating with your hands more than using chopsticks does. So when you use chopsticks, you have to kind of modify the type of foods you eat, right? You can't eat soup, for example, with chopsticks. So, however, whatever you can eat with uh, your hands, you can also eat with knife and fork and spoon. So that's kind of the difference between laparoscopic and robotic. Laparoscopic, there are some limitations and we've had to change the type of technique we use for certain operations um, from open to laparoscopic, whereas we can go back to more of that authentic traditional surgery um, moving from open to robotic surgery. That's kind of why I like robotics for, for many of the operations that we do. What I don't like about robotic is the scars are a little bit bigger than laparoscopic, and um, I have less control of how much tension the robotic arms put on the abdominal wall. And uh, I don't have as much leeway to, to hide my scars in patients when it's robotic. That tends to be very visible. And you know, I, I think cosmetics is a, a good um, adjunct to your hernia surgery. So that's kind of what I don't like about robotics, but in some people it's that's irrelevant and doesn't matter. So uh, in those situations, I do like robotics because you can do good suturing and stuff. And, and for example, here's another question about, do I use uh, sutures or tacks? Well, robotically, I always use sutures because suturing is really easy robotically and there's no need to use tacks. Tacks were only invented um, when laparoscopic surgery came around to aid in fixation when you can't really sew or it's very difficult to sew or the angle is different. That's irrelevant with robotics. So for robotic surgery, I don't use tacks, although some surgeons still use tacks for robotics. But for laparoscopic surgery, I don't suture, though many surgeons do suture, uh, I use tacks. Um, there are people that <laughs> had tacks put in open, but the original purpose of tacks, the reason why tacks were, which are like these little curly Q fixation devices, the reason why tacks were invented was for laparoscopic purposes, not for open. Although some people have had it placed open. So that's kind of my shtick about um, laparoscopic versus open surgery. I don't know if that was helpful. I would like to say that um, if you can at least get a consultation from a surgeon who knows how to do open laparoscopic and robotic surgery to help determine the pros and cons of each approach for your specific type of hernia. And then let's say um, that surgeon says like, yeah, you're best in for a laparoscopic repair or you're best for a robotic repair or you're best for an open tissue repair, let's say. Then if you don't wanna go with that surgeon, at least you know from a somewhat unbiased um, surgeon like what's the best option for you and then take that and then you can go to a surgeon who does that specific technique the best. So let's say you come to me as a consultation and I say, you know, I wouldn't put mesh in you. I would just do open repair without mesh or something like that. And for some reason you can't come to see me to do the surgery. Then you can go to your local surgeon and find the surgeon who does the best open surgery. Or I say, I would definitely do this laparoscopically. Don't let anyone put do this open, for example, or robotic, let's say. And for some reason you can't or don't want to do the surgery with me, at least take that information and now find the best laparoscopic or robotic surgeon near you who can do that operation. So that's my shtick. That's how I that's how I think. Um, I don't know. I would love your feedback. Please give me some feedback. I'd like to hear from you guys. Go on my social media on um, X or Instagram at Hernia Doc, on Facebook, as many of you are, at Dr. Tofi, and 
on YouTube, as you know, all of these episodes are on my YouTube channel at Hernia Doc. Do subscribe. It really helps. Um, and actually, if you like to listen to podcasts, do this as a podcast. And if you do, please like me on, on my podcast channel. That way more people can kind of see and interact with it. So I really appreciate that. On that note, I've got a great guest next week. I'm really looking forward to it. Um, see you next week for another Hernie Talk Tuesday. Thanks, everyone. Mm-hmm.